So remember back in March when I reviewed that little laptop called the Lightbook Alpha or the Alpha Lightbook? I can't remember what they wanted to call it. You remember it. It was that little white Chromebook competitor by a company called Alpha. It's November and Alpha has sent me one of their new laptops to review. Now it's important to point out that my review from March of the Alpha Lightbook, I purchased the Lightbook. It was not sent to me by the company. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the Alpha Centurion Nano and full disclosure, the company sent me this to review. Now, since the unboxing is already happening in the background, let's talk about the box. It is Spartan, just like the Lightbook. Other than the laptop, the charger, and some packaging, it is completely empty. There's no documentation or drivers or anything. The charger appears to be the same AC charger used by the Lightbook, so that's interesting. So the laptop is actually pretty nice. It's got an aluminum finish and it weighs about three pounds. For being called the Centurion Nano, it is pretty darn small and thin, but it's not the thinnest in the world. Much like the Lightbook, the laptop seems really easy to disassemble. Now the Lightbook had a little hard drive bay that you could take out to get to the hard drive, and while this one doesn't have that, it still looks pretty easy to take apart. On the one side, we've got a card reader, a USB-C port, a full-sized HDMI port, and a USB 3.0 port. On the back, we have absolutely nothing besides this giant hinge, which is freaking awesome. And on the other side, we've got our power input, another USB 3, and a headphone jack. Opening the lid is pretty drama-free because of that little cutout. The hinge design is fantastic. It feels very stable and it's easy to move the lid back and forth. Now looking at the keyboard, the first thing that everyone is going to notice is that there is a Windows key. Yep, there is a Windows key. Alright, got it out of your system, let's move on. The keyboard is actually pretty darn nice. It is flat chiclet style. Nothing terribly special about it, except for the power button. It's a Chromebook style power button, and I know that everybody hates these, but I think the hate is overblown. It's really not that bad, and the button doesn't do anything unless you actually hold it down, so you can't accidentally press it and shut your computer off. All the function keys seem pretty well placed. The volume up and volume down buttons are on the plus and minus keys, and I don't think I've ever actually seen that, but it's not bad. Alright, now that we got the unboxing out of the way, let's take a look at the software, starting with the BIOS. Now the BIOS is not an inside BIOS like the Lightbook was. It's actually made by American Megatrends, and it is meh at best. You can't really do much of anything in here besides turn secure boot on and off, so you won't really be spending any time in the BIOS. Now once we actually start booting onto the hard drive, the first thing you'll see is the Alpha OS boot screen. That's right, it looks like they did away with elementary OS and rolled their own. So if you buy one of these laptops, the first thing you're going to have to do when you log in is basically set up your user account. It's pretty standard OEM stuff, there's nothing special going on here. I think that the Lightbook did the exact same thing actually. So once you've set up your user account and you've logged in, this is it. This is Alpha OS. Now, in this video, we're not going to be covering Alpha OS. I'll leave that up to you guys. I'm sure in a month or two, there's going to be lots and lots of distro reviews on this. But this is a distro. It's not Ubuntu. It's not elementary OS. It is its own thing. So from here, all I've done is installed OBS, and I haven't changed anything else about the operating system. But this is the part where we're going to do a little exploring. So the first thing we'll do is check for updates, and we have App Center, which comes from Elementary OS. Now I don't know a whole lot about Alpha OS at this point, but I believe that it is basically Elementary OS with a new coat of paint and some themes and some other defaults. It could also be based on Ubuntu with Pantheon and some themes and stuff built on top of it. I'm not really sure, because what I'm doing for this video is reviewing the Centurion Nano, not Alpha OS. I'll leave that up to you guys. So if you've used App Center and Elementary OS, it's the same thing, nothing's changed. So we've got the file manager, and I believe that everything is using the Arc theme with Numix icons, which actually looks, it looks really good. They've chosen a background which matches the overall theme, and it makes the whole thing look really, really great. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of the Arc theme. I know that a lot of people dig it, but it's just, it's not my style. The new mix buttons in general look pretty good, but it seems like some of them are broken. Like, look at LibreOffice. I'm not sure if it's supposed to look like that or what. So they've got some interesting default applications, like GDebi is in there, and then Play on Linux makes a return. Now the funny thing is that Play on Linux is installed, but Wine is not. And this is kind of a weird error, because Play on Linux itself doesn't require the system version of Wine, because it manages its own Wine prefixes, but meh. Something I noticed in a number of applications was that the styling was broken. Now, Play on Linux is a special case, but it doesn't appear to be implementing the system styling right. Everything looks blocky and chunky, and something's just off. 
OBS is like this too, and I'm not sure if the problem is how the arc theme was installed or what, but it's kind of a reoccurring issue that will probably be patched in later versions. All of the system applications are based on whatever elementary OS and Pantheon comes with, so the settings are pretty much the same. It comes with a system monitor, which elementary OS doesn't come with. So despite the system monitor showing four different cores, this is actually a dual core i5 running at 3.1 gigahertz and it's hyper-threaded and you can upgrade it to an i7, but both of these processors are pretty popular nowadays. So yeah, I think that's gonna wrap up the software review here. Now let's dive into some benchmarks. I did a live stream the other day on Twitch where I used this lightbook to play some games. Now what I'm gonna do now is slideshow clips from that stream of all the games I played, and you'll see that this HD 620 is really solid. Here, let's check them out. So yeah, I think we're just about done with this review. To summarize what I think the pros and cons are, they go like this. I found the Wi-Fi to be somewhat weak. It supports up to 5 GHz, but I found that the range was somewhat disappointing. The sound quality in general was okay, but the speakers weren't very loud. It only has two conventional USB ports and that one USB-C port. Now because not a whole lot of devices out there use USB-C, you really only have two functional USB ports, and that's... Eh. The power input sticks out of the jack a little bit, and the lightbook was like that too, and it's actually secure, but I don't like it. Now my biggest gripe is actually the battery. They claim that it gets up to 7 hours, and if you look at other laptops with the i5-7200U, that's what it's supposed to get, but the battery life I experienced was nowhere near 7 hours. I think that maybe if you had the display on medium or low, and you weren't doing a whole lot with it, you might be able to squeeze 6, maybe 7 but I got closer to three or four, it wasn't great. Now for the pros. The GPU, as you saw from the gaming videos, was pretty darn good. Expandability, it's really easy to take this thing apart and put new hard drives or whatever you need to put in it. The keyboard was pretty darn good, but I found the touchpad to be really, really nice, especially when compared to the Lightbook, which did not have a nice touchpad. The build quality is good. It's pretty light and it's sturdy. I've got some sort of HP that I use at work that's supposed to be like an Ultrabook style, and I'd say that this Centurion Nano is actually a cut above in terms of build quality. And then finally the display. It's not the biggest display, but it's pretty nice and bright, and it has really good viewing angle. Now I think the big question that everybody's going to ask is, is it a good value? And I believe the starting price for this guy is about 700 bucks, and eh, 
I know that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, well, I can find a better laptop on sale at Best Buy. Or, and I mean, yeah, you can find better deals for laptops on clearance or Black Friday or whatever. I mean, that's a given. But in general, I'd say that the $700 asking price is reasonable. I'd say that if you're looking for a laptop that comes with Linux pre-built and something that you don't want to screw with installing a bunch of stuff on, yeah, I'd say that this is a good deal for you. But if you're looking for just a really, really good price and you don't mind getting your hands dirty and figuring out if everything is compatible with Linux and installing it and everything, you could probably find better deals elsewhere. But I think that the target audience for this laptop are people who don't want to worry about installing Linux and they just want a laptop that runs with Linux on it. And I think that for that audience, it's a pretty good value. So that's going to wrap this video up. I hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, feel free to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and share it on all your favorite social networks. I appreciate your support, and thanks for watching.